Hi everyone, how are you doing? It's Megan here. Happy Sunday. Um, it's good to be with all of you again to explore the book of Acts as we've been doing for the last, well, the last while. Um, we are officially in Acts chapter 11. Um, so if you have taken it upon yourself to look at the particular place in scripture that we're reading about, then you can find our story today in Acts chapter 11, 1 through Acts chapter 12, verse 25. So if you're really curious, we are reading from the Bible. Um, so you can look in the Bible for what we are talking about today. We are in chapter 17 today. We are getting quite far. Um, and the title of today's lesson is The Word of the Lord Increases. So who is God? God is the God of miracles. And our lesson theme for today is that God protects his messengers as many come to, as many come to faith through their preaching. Um, if you will remember, we recently talked about the conversion of Cornelius. Um, and in our story today, that comes up. So I'm going to briefly overview um, the story that Peter is going to tell that we have just read. So Peter tells his story about Cornelius's conversion. And the this Cornelius's conversion is really what changed Peter's heart to include Gentiles or non-Jewish people into the Christian church. And as someone who is not Jewish, I greatly appreciate that. And I'm sure some of you do too. So, so we were learned in our lesson about Cornelius that Peter had a vision. Um, and the vision was repeated three times. So God wanted Peter to know with certainty that God's church couldn't would include people from all races, nations, and with no partiality between them. Then there was a command. The Holy Spirit commanded Peter to go with go to with Cornelius's men immediately and without hesitation. There is a preparation um, through the visit of God's angel, Cornelius and his household were prepared to hear Peter's message of salvation. They knew ahead of time and they had prepared their hearts and minds to hear what Peter had to say. And then there was action. As Peter spoke, the Holy Spirit came upon P Cornelius and his household in the same way that the Spirit came at, to the apostles at Pentecost at the very beginning of Acts. Which goes to show that the, if the Holy Spirit can live in non-Jewish Christians, then who is Peter to reject them from the Christian church? So, this Cornelius' conversion was a big deal, you guys. And we're kind of learning a little bit more about the effects of Cornelius' conversion in today's lesson. The Old Testament and the New Testament revealed. What Old Testament passage has something to say about today's story? And we find it in Isaiah 49, 6, which says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Jesus, the servant of the Lord, is the light for both Jews and Gentiles. He's God's way of salvation for all people. So now it's time for our story time. I hope if you have your book, we're on page 157. If you want to read along, I will stop every once in a while to explain a couple of things that may not be super apparent. So if you'll stick with me, um, we can keep start this thing. You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them, exclaimed the circumcised believers in astonishment. I'm going to stop right at the beginning because there are some things in there that we may have questions about. So who are these circumcised believers that this sentence is talking about? There are around two, two opinions about who they are. Some say that they belong to a particular segment of Jewish believers who are particularly zealous or passionate about the Old Testament law. And some say... Um, that this simply means that all believers who had been born Jewish and who were circumcised. So those are kind of the two dominant opinions, like people who are particularly passionate about 
Old Testament or people like whoever was circumcised among the Jewish people. Um, regardless of what this is, the fact that Peter, one of the apostles, had been found eating and socializing with someone the Jewish people would have considered unclean was a matter of really great concern for the people. The church had been experiencing a reprieve from initial persecution and no one wanted to upset the Jewish authorities and bring unwanted attention on the church. Peter's actions were not only unlawful in their eyes, but they risked bringing harm to the disciples. So, so this, when I'm talking about Cornelius's conversion being a big deal, I'm saying it was a really big deal that could have put the church at risk even more than it already was. The second thing about this sentence that I wanted to point out is that the circumcised Jewish believer, believers couldn't believe that Peter would eat with Gentiles. Jews avoided visiting Gentiles and certainly would not have sat down and ate with them for fear of becoming ceremoniously unclean. Up to this point, strict laws, there were strict laws as to what was clean and unclean. Um, and contact between Jews and Gentile disciples remained at a minimum. Um, so, so, so the, the separation between Jews and Gentiles before Cornelius's conversion meant that there was a separation between Jew, Jewish and Gentile believers in the Christian church, which was a problem in God's eyes. So I'm going to continue after that very long spiel. Thanks for sticking with me, you guys, but I hope it helped a little bit. It was true. Peter had entered Cornelius's home, eaten with his family, and spent several days at the centurion's house. Law-abiding Jews wouldn't risk being called unclean by eating with Gentiles. And it wasn't long before the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem had found out what Peter had done and criticized him. Peter explained everything to these Jewish believers, telling them about his vision and the voice from God saying, kill and eat. He then talked about the visit of Cornelius's men at Simon the Tanner's house and the subsequent historic conversion of Cornelius and his household. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Household um, includes more than just Cornelius's immediate family. When we think of a household, you may think of your mom or your dad and your siblings. When the Bible talks about a household, they're talking about Cornelius's family, yes, but it also included several generations. So grandparents and great grandparents and aunts and uncles and maybe people who worked for the family. And at this time, it could have included slaves too. So we're talking the whole house and everybody involved when we're talking about the household. Peter said, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, I remembered the words of the Lord. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave these Gentiles the same gift of the Holy Spirit that he gave us, who am I to oppose God? Hearing Peter's account changed the minds of those who listened. And instead of objecting further, they praised the Lord, saying, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance into life. Do you remember the persecution in the early days of the church? The hatred against the believers that resulted in the apostles being imprisoned and Stephen being stoned? Because of that persecution, believers from Jerusalem and Judea had scattered as far away as Phionic... <laughs> Fionica. See, even I struggle with some of these names of places, so don't feel bad. Cyprus and the city of Antioch in Syria. At first they spoke only to the Jews, but, but soon some of the Hellenistic Jews believe, believers took the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles. In the city of Antioch, there God was with them, and many, many Gentile believed in the Lord. The Jerusalem church heard about what was happening in Antioch and sent Barnabas to check it out. He was pleased with what he saw happening and encouraged the believers in Antioch to remain steadfastly faithful to the Lord. Do you remember what the name Barnabas means? 
Bartimus was a good example of what his name meant, because everywhere he went he encouraged people. Luke wrote that Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. People liked Barnabas and listened to him, and many believed in the Lord Jesus through him. Not long after his arrival in Antioch, Barnabas traveled to Tarsus to look for Saul. So many people were becoming believers in the church in Antioch was growing rapidly. Barnabas needed a man to help and knew just the right person. From the beginning, Barnabas had recognized Saul's faith in, as genuine. Saul had extensive knowledge of the scriptures, and the Antioch church needed him. Barnabas set off on the more than two the more than 100-mile trip to Antioch to Tarsus, a journey that by foot would have taken a few days. It took time to find Saul because he might not have been in the city of Tarsus. During this time, he probably was traveling through Cilia and Syria, preaching the gospel to all who would listen. Finally, Barnabas found him and convinced Saul that he was needed in Antioch. The two went back to Syria. For a year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught the people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians because they believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and because they thought and behaved as Jesus had during his years of ministry. During the time that Saul and Barnabas were in Antioch, a prophet named, named Agabus came to Antioch from Jerusalem and through the Spirit declared a dire prophecy saying, Soon there will be a severe famine through the Re entire Roman Empire. In fact, the prophet's words did come to pass through the reign of Emperor Claudius. In response, the Church of Antioch gathered together a gift for the Jerusalem church and sent it by way of Barnabas and Saul to Jerusalem. Back in Jerusalem, the situation was bad. King Herod Agrippa I arrested some believers and then captured the Apostle James, the brother of John, and had him killed with a sword. When the king realized that the unbelieving Jews were pleased with this, he seized Peter as well and put him in prison. He intended to put Peter on public trial as soon as the Passover was over. So, I'm going to pause there for a second and talk about why they had to wait till Passover was over. Um, Peter was taken to prison at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread which was the beginning of a seven-day time of feasting that began with the celebration of Passover. Um, no trials or sentencing were permitted to take place during this time, according to Jewish law. So they, he couldn't put Peter on trial because during the Passover, it wasn't lawful to. But to prevent Peter's escape, the king set up squads of four soldiers in four places through the prison for four nighttime shifts. At each location, there were two soldiers standing guard while two soldiers rested. That means there were eight men on duty and eight men off duty at all times. The king was determined that there would be no escape for Peter this time. Meanwhile, the church gathered and prayed fervently for Peter's release. The night before the trial, Peter was asleep in his cell, bound to the soldiers beside him. Despite the fact that he thought he would die in the morning. Peter was trusting the Lord and resting peacefully. A bright shining angel appeared in the cell and nudged Peter in the side. The angel urged, get up quickly and follow me. Immediately Peter's chains fell, chains fell off. Peter followed the angel but he thought he was asleep and was seeing a vision. Through the iron gates of the prison and into the street they walked. And once away from the prison fortress, the angel disappeared. Peter realized that he hadn't been sleeping and that once again the Lord has sent his angel to deliver Peter from prison and from the hand of an evil king. Peter promptly went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark where believers were praying for him. Peter knocked at the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. She recognized Peter's voice and ran back into the house without even opening the door, exclaiming, Peter is at the door. The people thought she was crazy, but she kept on insisting, no, really, Peter is at the door. Come and see. 
Peter kept knocking and the people were astonished when they finally opened the door and found him waiting outside. The believers gathered around him and listened in amazement to Peter's account of his miraculous rescue. At the end of the story he told them, Tell James, the brother of Jesus, and all the other believers about what happened to me. With that, Peter left the city to escape further imprisonment by the king. What commotion there was in the morning at the prison! How could this man have escaped when he was chained to two soldiers and six other guards were watching at various places in the prison? King Agrippa I was frantic and searched everywhere without success. He cross-examined the guards and learned nothing new. He executed them. King Agrippa I traveled to Caesarea Martima. One day he was sitting on his royal throne. He was dressed in a silver robe that looked so regal, and he made such an eloquent speech that the people exclaimed, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because King Agrippa I didn't give praise to God, an angel from God struck him down. He was eaten by worms and died a horrible death. And the word of God continued to increase and spread. So that's the end of our story today. But once again, I'll draw your attention to the fact that the story ends with the phrase, but the word of God continued to increase and spread, which is in Acts 12, 24. Though these summary statements may sound boring, if you read them over and over again, they're very important to Luke's story. Um, not only do they show God's constant control over the events in the book of Acts, God is always in control, even when it seemed bad. Even when Peter was in prison with no hope of escape, God was still in control. But they also set the stage for the next part of the story. The summary statements also set the tone of the Holy Spirit's constant presence as the gospel goes forth from one place to another. The book of Acts, you guys, is all about God's control and the Holy Spirit. So, so in this case, we are reminded through this phrase that the Holy Spirit is always working around us, even if we don't see it. Um, and the book of Acts is trying to show us this. So I'm gonna let, let I'm gonna end today by this this idea that, but the word of God continued to increase and spread, and how God is always in control and the Holy Spirit is all around us if we pray and pay attention. So I hope that you learned something today. I know that I always do. I hope you have a happy Sunday, um, and I'll see you next week, you guys.